Hi, this is Tony Winyard, and you're listening to episode four of Exceeding Expectations. Today's guest is Greg Sadler, a philosopher, content producer, counsellor and coach amongst many things. He goes out of his way to really help the students he teaches to take in what he's teaching and give them a better experience. So in today's episode of Exceeding Expectations, I'm here with a man called Gregory Sadler, who's over in the United States. How are you doing, Greg? Good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So whereabouts in, in the States are you? So, you know, those great lakes that, that you see kind of intruding into them from the, the top end by Canada, I'm on one of those. I'm on Lake Michigan in Milwaukee. Ah, okay. And is that where you hail from? Have you always been around there? Yeah, I grew up in this area, uh, a little bit further west of here, out in the countryside. Now it's uh, mostly parking lots out there uh, because right. the city has grown so much. But yeah, we're right downtown about a mile from the lake. Right. Okay. And you, I mean, you've you've got quite a, a career. When I was looking at all the things that you've done, it, is, it would take me about a half an hour just to describe them all. <laughs> in production. So, yeah, and, and you, a lot of them have been kind of you know falling into things rather than deliberately choosing them. W- w- would you want to give us a, a brief um, sort of synopsis of some of the things that you've done? Sure. Um, I, let me actually work backwards. So, so I, now I'm I'm in a sort of entrepreneurial. Uh, sort of framework, but I, but I started out in traditional academia and I transitioned out of that. And I, I still take a lot of what I, what I do in traditional academia and apply it uh, in, in context, you know, so doing philosophy in a much more practical way. And, you know, before that, I, I held a number of academic posts, um, most of which were rather unusual. I, I taught in prisons, uh, at Indiana State Prison full time for six years in a, a program, you know, for degrees uh, for, for these, these prisoners was really actually quite, quite great because it, it cuts recidivism down considerably. Um, but it's a very hard sell to taxpayers to, that they should, they should fund this. Um, yeah. And I, I worked in a, a small historically black institution in the South that was, that was struggling and did a lot of uh, interesting work down there. Um, taught for Marist College. I, this last semester, I stepped in and taught two sections of ethics for, for Marquette University. But that, I, I usually don't do that too much anymore. Um, okay. And before that, you know, I had, I guess you could say I had the, the regular student life sort of thing. I, I went to undergraduate and I majored in philosophy and mathematics and came out, worked a bit here in Milwaukee, and then went to graduate school in Southern Illinois. I uh, got my master's and PhD there and, and uh, you know, did, did this typical sort of thing, a lot of reading, a lot of studying, a lot, quite a bit of partying as well. Um, but before that, I'd been in the Army for, for a bit. And, okay. uh, you know, I, I, it was similar. I, I enjoyed parts of it. Other parts uh, were, were not so good. Um, and I actually got out in the budget cuts of uh, – uh, 1990, after we, we started cutting the military massively before we in, embarked on new adventures in Gulf mm-hmm. War. Um, so, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, there's not that much else to say about before that, but I, I've been kind of lucky in that there have been a lot of interesting opportunities um, that came my way. And I, a lot of times, just sort of fell into them uh, by chance. And then I would. I would work pretty hard when I had them. So I've got some longstanding connections with various institutes and organizations. One of the other things that I do today is, as well as uh, outside of my work sphere, um, although it is a lot of work, is I'm the editor for Stoicism Today, um, which is a, a sort of subsidiary of the modern Stoicism organization. It's the main online, you know, you could call it online magazine or, or blog for um, the modern Stoic organization. And do a lot of organizational work and planning with them. Um, but, you know, that, that again, was something I, I kind of fell into. They asked me if I would do it, and I said, sure, and, and it's been uh, quite enjoyable. What would you say the to students' expectations would be? So that varies considerably here in the States. 
in part because we don't have a centralized educational system. Instead, we have this patchwork of thousands of colleges and universities, and each has its own culture, uh, each has its own ways of doing things. There are some sort of standards across the board because of the need for accreditation. Like, you know, semesters have to have a certain amount of days in them. Uh, you do get accreditors looking at your classes sometimes, but but it can be very, uh, uh, what would you say, disparate in, in how they actually examine it. So students often don't know what to expect when they come into class or they're, they're going from the experience that they've had with other instructors and it's a little it's kind of a dirty little secret of American academia that instructor quality and preparation and work ranges from the excellent to the abysmal. And yeah. there's it's not really a bell curve, with, you know, with with average in between and, and uh, you know, a, a good reliable. I would say it's more like a flat line where there's probably just as many terrible instructors as there are excellent instructors as there are average instructors. So, mm-hmm. you know, when a student comes into like, for example, the ethics classes that I taught last semester, mm-hmm. um, one of the, the comments that I had from the students was that they were very surprised that I was using the course management software um, when most of their other instructors didn't. And, you know, it, it, just to, I, I don't know if your, your listeners are familiar with this. So course management software, it's what allows you to create course sites and to place all sorts of resources in there and do the grading and provide, you know, all the instructions for the homework and, and sometimes even, you know, administer exams if you're doing online classes. Mm-hmm. And every college or university in the States these days that's out there has one of these. It might be Blackboard, it might be uh, Canvas, it might be Sakai. In the case of Marquette, it was Desire to Learn or D2L. And what I do, um, because I've been doing this for a very long time, once I recognize the potential of this, is I create lecture videos um, in, that I cite in my YouTube channel. I record my class lectures in class so that if a student misses a class, they're able to go over the material. There aren't any of these, you know, emails where they're tell- they're asking me, do you have the notes from, from, uh, last session? I give them handouts on the material that I've developed over the years and I'm continually developing new resources. I, I create lesson pages going over, uh, the, the, the key ideas, Um, What else? I create discussion forums. And these are just some of the things that I do for my academic classes, as well as the Reason IO Academy classes. So when a student comes in, they're getting what they should get, uh, a sort of comprehensive educational environment that has resources of all different modalities, focused on the material, oriented towards helping them understand Aristotle or Cicero or Immanuel Kant or whoever it may be. And um, I do this also with the assignments. Each assignment has its own uh, rubric, and uh, I, I use examples of good uh, uh, assignments that students have done, and I use examples of bad ones that are annotated, showing them where other students went wrong. Sometimes we have follow-up discussions about, you know, what's good or bad in, in particular assignments. Um, you know, when it comes to the final examination, I give them a review sheet, uh, over a month in advance. So the, the whole idea is to, you know, use the, the technology that we have to create, like I said, a comprehensive course environment. Now I do it in part because I know that the students are going to learn more, the more time they're spending with the material. So Mm. I don't want them just to come to class, having read through it once, talk in class, go home, maybe read it again. I, you know, I only get them for, for two and a half hours a week. It's not really three hours, uh, but you know, cause it's listed as a three credit hour thing, but those are three 50 minute hours, uh, sort of like psychiatrist hours. And mm-hmm. so I want to get them for 10 hours a week or 15 yeah. hours a week. And so by creating this environment, I do that. And then I get to introduce them to the thinkers and texts that I hope they're going to be reading five years from now when they're really facing tough situations. And they have a much better experience. Uh, and they come to me afterwards and, and say, you know, thanks for all the work that you put into the class. My other instructors aren't doing this. And I, and I feel bad for them because they're paying so much money 
they they deserve to have instructors who actually build this out for every single class. But most of the instructors at most of the places that I've taught don't do that. Even with the online classes, um, I'm, I'm teaching for Marist College, and uh, which is out in New York, and I, I started teaching there a while back face to face, and then transitioned to to online. And I use lecture videos that I, I create myself mm-hmm. to go over the material. And there are these students who are in this this program, and and some of them said, "I've taken eight classes with Marist." You're the first instructor who actually had videos for his class. So, you know, what I'm doing, I, I kind of look at it as this is best practices. This is what one ought to do. But mm. I'm vastly exceeding expectations in part because the expectations are unduly low. Mm. And I guess from, from what you said there as well, not only you mentioned about how great the videos are for, mm. for any student that aren't able to make the lecture, but even for the ones who did attend, they can go back if they didn't quite catch something or, or whatever. Yeah. So it's going to and, and, reinforce it. And, you know, there, well. there, it's interesting. There's research out there. This is, this is called lecture capture, right? Because we, you can do it with podcasts or do it with, with uh, video. And there was a lot of worry. And I had this worry myself that, well, if I record the videos, then students won't show up because, mm-hmm. you know, why the hell should they? They, they can get the same thing sitting at home. It actually helps to increase uh, retention of students when you record videos in class because they don't mm. want to miss it. Mm. And the other thing that, that the research has shown, uh, I don't know whether this is truly rational or not, but the students perceive you recording lectures as one of the best indices of you caring for them as, as persons. Mm. Um, it could be because it's the human form that's being recorded. You're providing them with an image of you. Um, I think there's also the sort of vulnerability. Most instructors are, are rather reluctant to get themselves on video. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's difficult to get, get them to, to actually uh, invest in, in doing it. Um, mm. But, it, you know, the research shows that, that students respond to it very favorably. And, I, and I, I understand why. If I was a student, I would want access to that. So therefore, I, it would sound like there's a lot more engagement, but probably also better pass rates as well, I'm presuming. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've, I've always worried about that. Um, in my classes, I don't have a bell curve, you know, with mm-hmm. C's in the middle and then D's and F's on, on one little fringe and A's and B's. Usually it breaks out the other direction where um, I, have a, I have some students who flunk and, and get D's. And then there's a few C's, and then most of the students are getting A's and B's. And you can say, well, maybe I'm too easy in my grading. Um, But, you know, I also assign more work than most instructors do. Every single week, my students are doing at least one assignment. Um, So that, that doesn't seem to be it. Um, and I, I hope that that really what it is, and I haven't done any scientific analysis of this, is because I'm providing them with so much support, for making their way into this d- difficult material, they um, they do better, you know, when I ask them to perform. And their attitude, you know, a lot of them come in and they're very afraid to take a philosophy class because they've heard it's so difficult. And then they start mm-hmm. reading Kant and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is this is nonsense. I can't make any any sense of this. But uh, every one of them is is capable of understanding the key ideas if they're given enough support. So that, that's what I try to do. And, and, and I do think it, it pays off, but I have had um, some scrutiny from administrators who, who ask, well, why do you have so many A's and B's in your classes? Are you giving easy grades? You know? Mm. Yeah. And what, what was it that made you start recording in the first place? Oh, well, there's a very interesting story there. Um, my, my fiance at the time, now my wife, was the one who pushed it. And originally I gave her a lot of resistance. And, you know, she, she's actually in, in educational technology. Um, she uh, was the person who designed and administered the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the Culinary Institute of America. Um, and now she, she does a lot of other things with, with uh, curriculum design. So she had bought me a flip cam, one of those little, you know, 50 to $70 cameras that you just carry around in your pocket. <clears throat> and it can be placed on a tripod. 
So she suggested to me my last semester at, at Fayetteville State University, I'd already decided I was moving up to New York and, and leaving that post, that I should record my lectures and put them on YouTube. And I said, well, who's going to want to watch that stuff? You know, I'm, I'm not a famous person and it's very low technology. You know, it's not like these other YouTube videos where they have animation and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And she said, just, just give it a try. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll do it for my students. So I was teaching four sections of critical thinking that semester. And I, in my first um, class of the day, I would just plunk the the tripod and camera down on one of the desks and uh, try to center it on the blackboard and then just go to town. And then we would put it into the institutional channel. And, and those early ones are all on the SIU institutional channel rather than my own channel. And within a couple of weeks, there were thousands of people viewing it uh, outside of my classes and saying, this is really helpful. My instructor won't explain anything <laughs> or I couldn't understand what they were talking about. Um, you know, do more of these. And so, you know, there was kind of a positive feedback loop there. And then when I went to Marist College, um, the semester after that, and I started teaching, you know, more service classes, intro to philosophy and, and ethics every semester, um, I did the same thing. And it was very, again, very low tech, just walking in, plunking the camera down, starting it up, um, doing no editing whatsoever. And um, again, thousands of people started watching them. People were commenting and it, it turned into a whole sideline of, of, of mine. And then it became very useful because the next time that I would go to teach a class, if I needed to miss the class, if I was ill or something, I could um, direct my class to the video. I could say, well, look, uh, I, I can't make it today. So here is something on Hobbes Leviathan chapter 13. You know, here mm -hmm. you just email it to them. And then it made it very easy for me to transition to online um, online teaching because I already had so much material. And I also got into the habit of creating handouts and and other things as well. Um, that made it easy for me to transition into online too. And so when you started doing that video back in those days, what was the students' reaction? Well, they, um, they liked it. Um, we talked about it a good bit. Um, they, they were happy to have it as a resource because if they missed class, uh, you know, like student athletes are inevitably going to miss some of your classes uh, because they have to go to games or things like that. Or if they were sick, some of my students would have to go to court for various reasons, um, or they might just, you know, oversleep. They had access to what we talked about. And they understood that, of course, you know, it, it wasn't quite the same, but mm. it was, it was uh, such a great remedy uh, as opposed to just like, you know, asking a random classmate, what did we cover in class or trying to email the professor, you know. Yeah. And, and it also helped me to improve my own teaching because when you see yourself on camera, I mean, I'm not a person who actually likes to watch my own videos, uh, mm. but I do sometimes watch them and say, wow, I, I, I need to say I'm less or, mm -hmm. you know, that's a very repetitive hand gesture that I do. Maybe I should, you know, uh, stop doing that because I think it's distracting for my students, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's helpful in that respect. And I think it's probably a, it improved my, my teaching. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So, I mean, every, everyone's winning. The students are, you are. Yeah. And, and it sounds like people who aren't even in your university are, are winning as well because they're learning. Well, um, yeah. And there should be a lot more recognition, I think, for for that sort of thing. And, I, and I'm not pushing it for myself because I, I already get enough on YouTube. But to try to get the other instructors into being uh, able and willing to do it, there needs to be a lot more support. And... Mm. Um, it's, it's just not happening in most places. And so from what I understand you said before, did, have you purchased all this video equipment or has the university purchased any of this? Oh, in my case, it was, it's, it's all been me. Um, right. Although, you know, in, in well-funded places or in places that aren't well-funded but, but want to allocate their, their priorities well, um, 
the you usually it's it's called the center for excellence in teaching and learning and it's kind of the hub for um faculty development that should be the place that that should have an entire set of uh cheap cameras and tripods and and things like that and they should loan them out to to teachers um mm-hmm. now oftentimes that doesn't happen because of of you know lack of, of information or, or, you know, they budget wrongly or uh, it's just not, not something that they're interested in. But the, the equipment is not very costly at all. Um, mm. To get a decent camera um, that you can use, you know, you're talking about anywhere from 70 to $200. I mean, you can use your, your, your phone or iPad now to do very good recordings as well. Mm. And, um, software, um, you know, if you, if you're a Mac user, iMovie is perfectly fine for, uh, for doing the kind of editing that you would need for academic videos. Mm. Um, you may not have all the bells and whistles that, that one might like, but, um, it's really all you need. And then a tripod, you know, the, the, the large tripod that we have, we bought from Amazon for $50. Mm. Um, and it's as good as, as most professional tripods. Um, so it's, it's very easy to break into. And I, I think a lot of people just don't realize that they could do that. And so they think they need to buy, you know, a $2,000 camera and very yeah. expensive sound equipment, uh, even worse. I'll, I'll tell you, this is a sort of a digression, but I've met people because of my, my work on YouTube who see my videos and then they tell me these horror stories of working with videographers and the videographers charge them thousands of dollars to produce one or two videos. And the videos are usually, you know, pretty slick in terms of, uh, you know, lighting and, and sound and stuff like that. But, you know, out of, you know, one, one camera, I've gotten at least 500 videos. Mm. Um, and I didn't spend thousands of dollars on it. So, mm. um, it's really sad to, to see some of these people that have been taken advantage of. It's sort of like with websites, right? It used to be back in the day, if you wanted to have a good website, you needed to hire somebody and they had to have some very specialized skills. Um, and, and you can still do that if you want to and pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, or you can invest a bit of time and thought and uh, produce your own website um, and, and do so fairly cheaply, you know, or, or hire somebody else who actually is affordable. So the other um, professors at your university, they haven't gone along the same lines. They haven't seen how the great results that you're getting and it hasn't encouraged them to do the same. There's a few. Um, I have a few colleagues and friends at, at, you know, here and there in different universities who um, have done it. And then a a slightly larger number who have recognized how how useful it can be. But I think many of them, many of the others, are, are quite resistant to it. They see it as, as one more demand on their time and they don't understand how good it is for their students and mm-hmm. how good it could be for their own, you know, if, if they want to, you know, get the message out there about uh, the area of their research uh, and establish themselves as an expert in it, um, mm-hmm. all they need to do is shoot some, you know, good videos and they could easily uh, do that. But, but, but many of them see it as, you know, one more demand on their time. Um, sometimes there, there can even be, uh, some, some denigration of it as, as, you know, popularizing philosophy. This has always been a big problem. I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with popularizing philosophy. I think that's, that's the way it used to be. And that's what Mm -hmm. we want to go back to. But I think there's a lot of fear among fellow academics that, um, if we open the door to this sort of thing, uh, there goes the profession, you know? Mm. <clears throat> so are there other areas that you feel that um, students have been surprised by some other things that you've done? Um, well, students, uh, for my academic students, probably not so much. My reason I owe students you know, because I've been offering courses independently now on, on mostly classical philosophy uh, for a while, are often surprised by the <clears throat> the range of other other services that I offer. Um, you know, one of so courses are are one thing that I do with Reason I, which is my company, but I also do a lot of public speaking. 
Um, I do uh, philosophical counseling and coaching. I do some consulting work with a, with a few organizations, uh, and then I do tutorial services. So <clears throat> students are, you know, when they find out um, just how many ways I can make philosophy accessible or or, or useful for them, uh, they're often quite surprised by that. And some of them do take me up on it, and I and I have some some uh, clients who may start out booking me for one kind of uh, service and then bringing me in for other things. So I have, for example, one CEO of a small startup um, who originally booked me for tutorial sessions, which he still continues. Where I'm still walking him through a number of different philosophical works, uh, brought me into his company as a an ethics consultant as well. Uh, to work on some of their projects. Um, or people may become aware that they could use philosophical counseling or coaching. And um, then, you know, they, they book me for those services as well. Or, you know, mm. they, they find out that I'm also a public speaker and then they bring me in to talk. Mm. Wow. Well, how, I mean, if people want to, to check out some of your videos, I mean, you've got a YouTube channel, haven't you? Yeah, I've actually got three, um, although I, I haven't contributed too much to the, the smaller two for quite a while. Uh, the main one is is uh, uh, the just Gregory B. Sadler. If anybody just Googles it, they'll, it'll pop up on YouTube. Mm. And I've got over, I think, 1,100 videos in there now. Wow. Um, and I, I, I add about another 250 a year. Um, so that's that's one place that they can go to. Um, if they're interested in, in the Reason IO Academy, if they if they just you know go to the reasonio.com website, is that Reason I letter I letter O? Yeah, like Reason it out or or right, Reason okay. input output would be another mm-hmm. another way to do it. But we have our we have our own um, you know courses as well, and then. Um, what else? If they're if they're interested in um, my my writing, I, I blog in a number of different places. Um, although not as frequently as I'd like to, I, I do too many other things to to get to mm-hmm. it regularly. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of spread out across the internet. If you if you actually just type in Gregory Gregory B Sadler, mm-hmm. you, you'd be surprised how many things uh, come up in in Google. I discovered that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I was doing research for this. Yeah, wow. So, and it, I get the impression from the the, the 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 passion that you've been speaking with that you really enjoy what you do as well. Yeah, and and again, it's something I I fell into. I didn't I didn't think th- this out. You know, I, when I was in, in high school, I didn't even think I was going to go to college. I thought I would go in the army and stay there for life. Um, and then when I went to college, I had no idea I was going to you know, eventually become a professor and then leave the academy and start doing this sort of stuff. But, you know, so philosophy, um, the, the texts and thinkers that I get to work with are so rich and they offer so many great resources for helping people think about life problems or the organization that they, they're working in or leadership or ethics or whatever it happens to be. There's so much content there that, um, I'm kind of like in a middleman position and I, and I'm, it, it's like a, being a middleman with a inventory that is just like stock to the gills. Mm. And it's up to me to not be a bottleneck and rather be somebody who, who opens this up to, to the general public. And, and it turns out that, and, and this is, I don't, you know, I don't mean to brag here, but um, I, I have a, a talent for taking complicated philosophical concepts or, or distinctions and mm-hmm. making them understandable to ordinary, regular people without mm-hmm. losing the meat, without losing the rigor. And so mm-hmm. I, I don't talk down to them. I, I, I help them understand things, but I use a lot of examples and I, I speak in a very relatable way. I don't know how the hell I did it. You know, it mm-hmm. just it just worked out that way. It probably has to do with teaching a lot of, of service classes to students, I imagine. But um, so I, I try to capitalize on that. And when I'm when I'm doing my job well and I see people, you know, when the, the proverbial light bulb goes off in people's heads, mm. um, when I get to see that, uh, and it's because Aristotle or Epictetus or, or Thomas Aquinas or pick whoever you want really is the one doing the heavy lifting, um, 
I'm gratified. And so I get that kind of experience pretty frequently. Hmm. Yeah. Well, well, Greg, it's been, it's been great speaking to you. I mean, is there anything that you'd like to say to, to people along the lines of, you know, being able to exceed what their customers or students in your case expect? Yeah, actually there is. And, and I hadn't thought about this before, but I think that this fits in really well with the sort of focus on, on students and education. Um, like I said, many of my students come into my classes intimidated about philosophy and they think this, this can't be for me. It's too over my head. I'm not up to it. And I give them a pep talk at the beginning of the semester and, and a, a few other times. And I think this would be good for your listeners. Anybody who wants to study philosophy can do so. This is the way it's been done throughout history. It's not, I mean, there may be particular thinkers that are harder to get into because of our temperaments or our backgrounds, but for everybody out there, there's at least three philosophical thinkers that if I sat down with you, I could, you know, sort of map out, you could study this one, you could study this one, you could study this one, and you would be able to understand them and apply them to your life. It's just a matter of putting in the time, finding the resources, and then generally working with, with somebody who's, who's gone through it themselves. Mm. Well, it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure, Greg, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come on your podcast. Next week in episode five, we have Tracy Butterfield. She's a wedding planner and a founder of WedX, and she has some really great stories. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, and it will be great if you could leave a review on iTunes. And do get in touch if you know of someone who goes out of their way to exceed their customers' expectations. Mm-hmm.